Greetings, viewer. Don't forget to visit my website for links to support the production of these works if you value what I'm doing. I appreciate any help you can offer. Thank you for having a look and a listen. Yours, John Loth. Recorded, edited, and produced by John Loth. The Evolution of Civilizations an Introduction to Historical Analysis by Carol Quigley Chapter 2 Man and Culture At certain seasons of the year great turtles come in from the sea to deposit their eggs on tropical beaches. They return to the sea immediately, leaving their eggs to hatch in due time from the heat of the sun. Eventually, the little turtles emerge from their shells, push up through the warm sand, and head for the sea. There, guided by a sure instinct and without any need for instruction or learning, they take care of themselves, seeking food where it may be found, and avoiding the dangers which are everywhere. Enough survive to maturity to maintain this species of turtle in existence. The ability of this species of turtle to survive depends upon two factors. One, so many eggs are hatched each year that, even with heavy losses of the young, a sufficient number reach maturity. Two, these turtles are able to grow up without learning or instruction because their nervous systems are connected up and functioning as soon as they emerge from their shells. The newly hatched turtle is not so much an immature turtle as a small turtle. With exception of his reproductive instincts, a newly hatched turtle is as fully equipped with a functioning muscular and nervous system as is an adult turtle. Living things that can care for themselves in this way and for this reason are not unfamiliar. Insects do so, and so too do such animals as chicks and ducklings. But man is constructed on an entirely different plan. When a baby is born, it is quite incapable of taking care of itself, and remains relatively helpless for years. Indeed, it would seem that twenty or more years are necessary before a human being reaches maturity. The helpless condition of the newborn human arises from the fact that his neurological and muscular systems are largely undeveloped and uncoordinated. His nervous system, in particular, is like the telephone system of a great city in which almost none of the connections from phone to phone or from phone to switchboard are closed. Of course, this comparison is by no means perfect, for the human nervous system is much more complicated, much more adaptable, and much faster than any telephone system. The human brain alone, as a kind of central switchboard, has millions of neural connections. Other millions are distributed throughout the body. The way in which these are connected up, or even the fact that they come to be connected up at all, depends on what happens to the child, how he is trained, and how he grows. The things he is capable of becoming originally we can speak of as his potentialities. The things he does become as the result of experience and training we can speak of as actualities. The sum of his potentialities we call human nature, while the sum total of his actualities we call human personality. It is quite clear that human nature, potential qualities, is much wider than human personality. Actually developed qualities. Indeed, we might assume that everyone at birth or even at conception has the potentiality for being aggressive or submissive, selfish or generous cowardly or brave, masculine or feminine, pugnacious or peaceful, violent or gentle, and so forth, and that which of these potential qualities becomes actual, or to what degree it does so, depends very largely on the way in which each person is trained, or on the experiences he encounters as he grows up. The fact that there are societies or tribes in which almost everyone is aggressive, like the Apaches, and that there are other closely related tribes in which almost everyone is submissive, like the Zufi, and the fact that infants taken from one tribe and reared in the other grow up to have in full measure the typical characteristics of their adopted tribe, 
would seem to indicate both that all such people are potentially about the same at conception and that their personalities are largely a consequence of the way in which they are reared. If this is so, it is clear that the way in which people are brought up is very important. This is, of course, evident from the consideration already mentioned, namely that humans are helpless at birth and must be cared for and trained during a period of many years. The way in which they are cared for and trained depends very largely on the personalities of the people whom they encounter as they are growing up. But these personalities again depend on the way in which these adults were reared. Thus there appear in any society certain patterns of action, of belief, and of thought that are passed on from generation to generation, always slightly different, both from generation to generation and from person to person in any single generation, but possessing a recognizable pattern. This pattern depends not only on the way people are trained to act, to feel, and to think, but also on the more concrete manifestations of their social environment, such as the kind of clothes they wear, the kind of shelters in which they live, the kind of tools they have for making a living, the kind of food they eat and how they eat it, the kind of toys they have to amuse themselves as well as the kind of weapons they have to defend themselves. All of these things, patterns of action, feeling and thought, as well as concrete objects used in these activities, are known in the social sciences as culture. This culture forms the environment in which a child grows up as the natural environment surrounds the baby turtle, as it grows up in the sea. Man is surrounded by natural environment, to be sure, but it is much more remote from him than from the turtle. For in man's case, culture intervenes as a kind of insulation between him and his natural environment. In fact, the surrounding environment of culture penetrates both into him as a person and into his natural environment, changing both. His neurological reactions and behavior in feeling and in thought are largely determined by his cultural environment, and at the same time this cultural environment modifies his natural environment by such activities as heating his home, cooking his food, cutting down forests, draining swamps, killing off animals, and generally modifying the face of the earth. We have said that the individual's reactions in behavior, in feeling, and in thought what we call his personality, are largely determined by his cultural environment. At the same time, his personality is part of the cultural environment of those people whom he meets, and as already said, only by such relationships is his personality developed from his human nature. All this makes a human being so different from a turtle that nothing very relevant to human behavior can be learned from the study of turtle behavior. With the turtle we are dealing with a twofold situation, the turtle and his environment. With the human being we are dealing with a threefold situation, the human being surrounded by his culture and both together surrounded by the natural environment and by other cultures. Where a turtle lays dozens of eggs in hopes that some turtles from those eggs can be carried to maturity by obedience to fairly rigid instincts, the human has almost no rigid instincts and adapts his personality to his culture. The culture in turn must adapt itself to the natural environment. Thus, if the natural environment changes, the turtle must change his nature, while man merely changes his culture and thus his personality. But this beautifully flexible relationship requires such a long period of training and learning, during which human nature becomes a human personality and the individual becomes able to care for himself, that humans are dependent upon their parents for many years. Accordingly, humans have few offspring, and each offspring is very valuable, since the survival of the species does not depend, as with turtles, on the more or less accidental survival of a very few out of the many reproduced, but depends instead on the ability to bring up almost all who were born and to train them 
so that they can take care of themselves, have the intelligence to modify their culture, including their personalities, when it becomes necessary to adapt to the environment, and at the same time develop the capacity to use the freedom to change their behavior, which this whole situation assumes in such a way that it will be beneficial to themselves and to the group on which they depend for the continuation of their culture. All this leads us to certain tentative assumptions about human nature, about the nature of culture, and about the nature of human society. In regard to human nature, it would seem that we have to deal with two things. A. A wide range of potentiality, and B. A drive to make these potentialities actual. The range of these potentialities seems to run a full gamut from the most concrete and material activities such as eating or moving about, through a broad belt of emotional and social activities, to a fairly broad range of spiritual and intellectual activities. It would be rash to say that this range of potentialities has very specific qualities or needs in it, or that there are any intrinsic dividing lines separating one potentiality from another. A study of human personalities and human cultures would seem to indicate that these potentialities blur into one another, that each person has opposing and even incompatible extremes of each potential quality and that there can be a good deal of substituting of one potential quality for another, as these qualities develop into actual characteristics. Any divisions we may make in the gamut of human potentialities are probably arbitrary and imaginary. We might divide the range into two, physical and spiritual, or into three, physical, emotional, and intellectual, or into four, a. Material needs, such as food, clothing, shelter. B. Sex. C. Gregarious needs, such as companionship. And D. Psychic needs, such as a world outlook, psychological security, or the desire to know the meaning of things. We could indeed divide this gamut into 40 or into 400 divisions or levels, since the reality with which our words seek to deal is a subtle, continuous, and flexible range quite beyond our ability to grasp clearly or fully. This range of human potentialities will sometimes be divided in this book, for purposes of historical analysis, into six levels, as follows. 1. Military 2. Political 3. Economic 4. Social 5. Religious, 6. Intellectual. Although this division will always be made with the full realization that it could, with good justification, be made otherwise as 5, 7, 60, or 600 levels. This range of human potentialities is also the range of human needs, because of man's vital drive that impels him to seek to realize his potentialities. This drive is even more mysterious than the potentialities it seeks to realize. Throughout history, men have given various names to this drive, and there have been endless disputes about its names and about its extent and nature. The classical Greeks, like Aristotle, sought to ignore it by merely assuming that everything had a purpose, and that everything by its very nature sought to achieve its purpose. This is generally known as a teleological explanation, from the Greek word teleos, meaning purpose or goal. In the Christian Middle Ages, this teleological approach was somewhat modified by the belief that, while everything had a purpose, things were drawn to seek to fulfill these purposes by the love of God. About the year 1600, men began to place this drive inside men, driving them on rather than outside, drawing them on, as before 1600. Spinoza, about 1670, called this drive the soul. About 1818, Schopenhauer called it will. About 1890, Bergson called it the vital urge, while at the same time, Freud called it sex. Throughout this latter period, 
Many natural scientists called it energy. Without getting into any controversy about the merits of these various terms, we can agree with them all that there does seem to be some force driving men to seek to realize their potentialities. Before going further to examine how these efforts produce both culture and societies, let us try to sum up our conclusions regarding the divisibility of the range of human potentialities by the following diagram, in which the distance between the line AB and the line CD represents this range. The various columns represent various ways in which it might be divided. This range as a whole we shall call the dimension of abstraction. When these potentialities of human nature are realized, they become the characteristics of human personality. This is very helpful, for we cannot directly observe or study human nature, and are compelled to make assumptions as to what it must be like from our studies of human personality. Since the characteristics of human personality emerge from the potentialities of human nature as a result of experience and training, and since each person's experience and training are different, each personality is different. At the same time, since each person in the same society is brought up in the same culture and thus tends to have similar experiences and similar training, most of the persons in a society tend to have a basic personality pattern, with similar general characteristics, either emphasized or subdued. Not only is human personality formed by the social environment, the social environment, or culture, is largely made up of the personalities it has created. In this way, culture is passed down from generation to generation, always somewhat changed but always largely the same. From this point of view, culture is known as the social heritage, passing on from generation to generation by teaching and learning, most of it unconscious. When a child is first trying to walk, he may fall without actually hurting himself. What happens in the next few moments may contribute considerably to the formation of his future personality. If an adult swoops down on him, full of sympathetic sounds and commiseration, he may decide that he is hurt and begin to cry. This could easily become one of the earliest steps toward forming a personality that reacts to the unexpected with self-pity. On the other hand, such a fall might lead some neighboring adult to say, get up Jimmy and try again. You must be more careful and watch where you are going. This could easily be an early step toward self-responsibility and self-reliance. Frequently, after such a fall, the child, if ignored, will be frustrated and resentful. Struggling to his feet, he may strike out at the nearest person or at some inanimate object. Again, the reactions of surrounding adults depend upon the personality patterns of the culture and serve to mold the developing personality of the child. There are societies where a frustrated child who strikes at an innocent bystander might be admired. Look at that spirit. Isn't he the little man? This serves to encourage the development of a culture based on personalities of irrational aggressions. If, on the other hand, a child who displays an early response of aggression to frustration is immediately stopped, has his hands slapped to discourage such a reaction, and is sternly warned, you fell because you were not careful and did not watch what you were doing. Mrs. Jones has nothing to do with your fall, so don't you dare strike at her. In such a case, the child's personality will be turned from aggression to self-responsibility. Episodes such as this occur many times a day in every society. When they occur, the people involved react to them in accordance with their own personality structures. Few of the persons involved in such a situation stop to think that they are involved in a teaching situation and are helping to mold the society of the future by helping to mold the personality of one of its members. In highly integrated societies, such as most primitive tribes, the outcome of each such episode, as this, will be similar because the adults involved 
have similar personality structures, and as a consequence, the children growing up who occasion such incidents will experience similar reactions and will themselves develop similar personality structures, whatever these may be. In a more complex and more disintegrated society, such as our own, the personality structures of adults are already so varied that it is difficult to say how they would react to the event we have described. Thus, quite different reactions might occur, and the children who are at the center of these episodes, by experiencing different reactions, will grow up with different personalities, thus continuing and probably increasing the disintegration of the society's behavior patterns. There can be no doubt that we could have predicted the social response to any act of childish aggression a century or more ago, with some assurance. The child would have been punished. But today, it would be impossible to guess what might happen. And just as the possible reactions have become more varied, so the personalities developed from such reactions have become more diverse, and the society itself has become less integrated. The culture of a society consists of much more than the personalities of the people in the society. It consists of all the material things they use, such as the dwellings, tools, and clothing already mentioned. It consists of patterns of actions, feeling, and thought. It consists of established social relationships between one person and another, as well as between persons and objects. It consists of all kinds of fine, subtle, and changeable interrelationships between people and between groups, relationships and feelings that are sometimes obvious but are frequently unobserved, reactions that are so long established and thus so natural that they are neither noticed nor questioned. Each individual in a society is a nexus where innumerable relationships of this character intersect. Taken as a whole, these innumerable relationships, many of them deeply embedded in his neurological system, form a status which was slowly created as he grew up and will be abruptly destroyed when he dies. The gap created in the fabric of society by the death of an individual is slowly closed as some of the ruptured relationships are healed over, many others are taken up by different persons, and the many social functions that formed the previous status are taken over by a number of quite separate persons. Culture is thus a very subtle and very complex thing. From our point of view, it is the cushion between man's purely animal nature and the natural environment. From another point of view, it is the social heritage passed down from generation to generation. From another point of view, it is a complex melody of personalities, material objects, patterns of behavior, subtle emotional relationships, accepted intellectual ideas and intellectual assumptions, and customary individual actions. From any point of view, it is constantly changing and forms the chief subject of study in all the social sciences. This culture is both adaptive and persistent. It is adaptive because it is able to change, and it is persistent because it will not change without cause. The cause of such social change are both internal and external to the culture. They include the geographic, the biologic, and the cultural environment. The geographic environment includes such things as terrain and climate. Obviously, culture must adapt itself to these. Consequently, the Eskimos have quite a different culture from the Arabs of the desert or the jungle Negroes. And it is equally clear that as geographic conditions change, cultures must change too. When all of Europe was under glacial conditions, the cultures there must have been different from what they became when all of Europe was under thick forests, about 8,000 B.C., or under temperate conditions, under 1,000 B.C. The cultures in Europe adapted themselves to these changes. Similarly, culture adapts itself to changing biologic conditions. When the herring swarmed in the North Sea, in the late Middle Ages, or the buffalo swarmed, 
on the North American plains in the early 19th century. The people living in these areas had cultures adapted to these conditions. But when the herring disappeared, or the buffalo were largely exterminated, the people of Northern Europe, or the Indians of the Great Plains, had to adapt their cultures to such changing biologic environment. In a similar fashion, but to a much greater degree, cultures must adapt themselves to changing cultural environments. These latter include the culture itself, as well as other different cultures. When a culture changes because one part of it must adapt itself to a different part of the same culture, we say that it is self-adaptive. Thus, when a culture gets a different weapon, as when the Indians on the Great Plains obtained the whores after 1543, or obtained guns after about 1780, the religious, intellectual, social, economic, political and military aspects of the culture are changed by this new acquisition. At the same time, a culture must adapt itself to other cultures, as the culture of Western civilization has to adapt itself to the culture of Soviet Russia, or as the people of Tahiti, or the people of China, had to adapt their cultures to the culture of Western civilization during the 19th century. When a culture is not able to adapt itself to changes in its geographic, biologic, or cultural environment, it may perish, just as the cultures of the American Indians, culture of the ancient Carthaginians, perished when these people were unable to adapt themselves to the impact of Western civilization or to that of classical civilization. It is worth noting that when animals, like the dinosaurs, are incapable of adapting their physical structure to changes in the environment, the species perishes. But man, who has the insulation of culture between his physical structure and his environment, merely undergoes destruction of his culture instead of destruction of his species, when his culture cannot adapt itself to changes in the environment. It sometimes happens that a culture is unable to adapt itself to changes in part of itself, for example, a change in weapons, which is part of culture, may be so drastic, like the atom bomb, that the other parts of the same culture, such as the economic and political systems, cannot adapt themselves to this military change, and the culture will perish. This means that cultural changes are not necessarily progressive, but are frequently irrational, retrogressive, and destructive. A culture may even commit suicide. For example, at a remote period, the culture of the Aztec people in Mexico changed on the religious level by the introduction of human sacrifices to one of their gods. The military level adapted itself to this religious change by changing its tactics from an effort to kill the enemy to an effort to capture the enemy, so that captives could be used as religious sacrifices. This change injured the culture's ability to defend itself, because the Aztecs no longer fought to defend themselves or to kill their enemies, but fought to capture them for sacrifices. When the Spaniards under Hernando Cortes arrived in Mexico in 1519, the Aztec defense was much hampered by the fact that they were fighting to capture, while the Spaniards were fighting to kill. Because culture is adaptive to itself, it is integrative, but because it is also adaptive to diverse external influences, as well as to the human drive to realize human potentialities, no culture ever becomes integrated. By integrative, we mean that the different parts of a culture adapt themselves to one another and tend to become increasingly an interlocking unified system in which each part fits snugly into all the surrounding parts. But this result is never reached for at the very moment that one part of culture is adapting itself to another part to become more closely fitted to it, it is becoming less adapted to some third part, which is also changing under influences from some other source. Thus no culture ever becomes integrated. This is a good thing, because a fully integrated culture would be rigid and would resist change so completely that it would become incapable of adapting itself to changes in its external environment, on the one side, and incapable of fulfilling man's drive to realize his potentialities on the other side. 
A fully integrated culture would be like the dinosaurs, which had to perish because they were no longer able to adapt themselves to changes in the external environment. Accordingly, culture is made up of loose-fitting parts that are only partially adapted to one another, to the environment, and to human needs and are constantly changing in response to shifting pressures from these three directions. It is able to survive just because it is not rigidly integrated. So far we have spoken about culture. This is the part of reality with which history is concerned, but it is only part of the whole picture that historians must examine. The rest of this picture is made up of the persons whose activities created the culture. It must always be remembered that culture is the consequence of persons seeking to realize their potentialities sufficiently to satisfy their inner drives. Without human beings, there would be no culture. It is equally true that without culture there would be no humans, but only animals, in direct contact with their natural environment. The whole combination of human beings plus their culture we call, by various names, such as societies, social groups, or even civilizations. These terms have different meanings that we shall examine in a moment. Before we do, we should sum up the stage we have reached in our discussion. We could write our last conclusion as an equation thus. Society equals humans plus culture. The society is surrounded by its natural environment to which it adapts itself by changes in its culture. Thus the whole relationship might be represented by a diagram. Natural environment being the outer ring, culture being the middle ring, and humans being the innermost circle. The rigid lines between these concentric circles, like the plus mark in the equation just given, are misleading, because culture is not rigidly separated from the human beings on the one hand and from the environment on the other. Rather, it penetrates into both. In fact, much of culture is inside human beings because it takes the form of trained neurological reactions, developed muscles, emotional reactions, ideas, both clear and vague, and the established patterns of acting that make the difference between human personality and human nature. Human personality is the part of culture that is inside human beings and can be observed. Also inside human beings, but beyond the limits of our observation, is human nature. Such human nature is made up of potentialities and the drive or drives to express these. What these potentialities or drives are we cannot know from observation, but only from inference based on our observations of personality. In addition to personality, which is inside human beings, Culture has manifestations outside human beings. This external culture consists of networks of human relationships, of concrete tools and instruments, called artifacts, and of symbols for communication or expression. In order to develop their potentialities so that human personalities emerge from latent human nature, human beings establish relationships with one another. As the child develops, these relationships are extended from such fundamental relationships as those with mother and nurse to those with parents, siblings, and teachers, to those with friends, with the opposite sex, with business relations, with representatives of the government, like the police, the tax collector, and the draft board, and with one's fellow citizens and fellow soldiers. All these relationships, as part of culture, form groups of human beings. Of these groups, there are many different kinds. We shall distinguish four different kinds at this point. 1. Social groups. 2. Societies. 3. Producing societies. And 4. Civilizations. All are made up of aggregates of human beings with their personalities and external culture. If you enjoyed this recording, you can find more and support the production of these works at my website, johnloth.wordpress.com. That's www.johnloth.wordpress.com.
dot com. Thanks for having a look and a listen. Your friend, John Loth.